S&Ps are off four and a half. Let's go over to our man, Mr. David Maza. David is the head of product development, managing director of Direction. And of course, uh, we have plenty of calls on the Direction ETF structures, uh, whether we're talking financials, whether we're talking uh, the small caps, whether we're talking oil, and whether we are talking gold. David, welcome to TFNN. Hey, thanks for having me on today. Absolutely. So, you know, uh, ETFs in general, David, right? Uh, what's so intriguing is that, you know, we have a lot of guests, of course, and listeners that love yeah. trading your, your doubles and your triples, right? Could you just sure. give us, can you give us a little history of the ETF market in general? Because I, I think what, you know, some of the newer listeners, younger listeners don't realize that they haven't been around forever. That's right. ETFs were actually first launched in 1993, uh, and, and really the first one was SPY, uh, and it was targeted to institutional investors as an alternative to a futures contract. And of course, since that time, there's been ETFs on fixed income, convertible securities, gold, uh, and, and of course, uh, the triple leveraged uh, uh, long and short ETFs, which we um, really pioneered in the 3X side. We have a competitor that, that, that is in the space as well. So it, it's still actually, to your point, a relatively new market. And really only recently have we seen a wide range of investors really access the products, both for long-term allocations, and in particular, uh, the vehicles that we offer for investors looking to amplify their exposures to trades on a short-term tactical basis. So what I love about ETF is whether you're buying one share or a million shares, everyone pays the same price. All the information from a trading volume perspective, et cetera, it's democratic and it's available um, to retail investors, institutions, et cetera. Yes, when you talk about democratic, it's absolutely changed the business. I mean, in the last 15 years, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, historically, in, in investors, you know, you had a few options. You could either give your money to an active mutual fund and maybe hope, hope that a manager, whether they're picking stocks or bonds, would have the ability to outperform. Or if you're a do-it-yourself investor, um, you know, there was tools available to you, individual securities, of course. and. Um, but really, the access points were zero. What's, what's great about ETFs, um, there's a significant amount of liquidity behind them. But as you know, and I'm sure as you talk about all the time with your listeners, we, we're talking about you know, not just the S&P 500. We're talking about every sector. We're talking about every industry. We're talking about global exposures, fixed income exposures, what have you. So the ability to have um, both tools to build long-term portfolios and tools to take advantage of trends um, that may be short-term in nature are really available in a never-before way with ETFs. You know, it's going to be interesting here. You know, the, the it seems that we have a lot of listeners, no doubt, that they, they, they love trading the financials, the small caps, yeah. gold. And let's, if we can talk about the financials a second, because what has happened is that, you know, as of last week, you know, you have the large broker-dealer community. They're going down to zero commissions. You have your FAS, your FAZ, that people love trading. The, the aspect of, you know, the Russell 1000, the makeup inside of that, like when that changes, I guess you have to change your makeup inside yeah. the FAZ and the FAS, right? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, the intention of FAS and FAZ is to offer amplified exposure on a daily basis to the Russell 1000 Financial Services Index. In that basket, though, is a diversified exposure to financial. So the performance on a daily basis is going to be driven um, by, you know, both your money center, mega cap banks, there's still real, uh, real estate investment trusts in there, there's regional banks, there's insurance companies. Um, so it's that broad-based perspective of financials. You know, we also have ETFs that are focused on regional banks, for example. So we oftentimes are seeing investors now play those two uh, relative to one another. So let's say maybe we want to see what um, uh, impact the yield curve might have just on regional relative to the large cap um, banks. You know, we tend to see investors doing both the long and the short side on that of late, because to your point, um, you know, financials, um, it's been a difficult long-term trade um, for good reason, primarily because of the yield curve and because of the cost pressures that continue to be there. But for traders, there's still a lot of opportunities. Yes. Now, have you seen in the past, like, say, five to seven years that the actual trading community has got a lot more educated than the aspect of what a double uh, leverage product is, what a triple leverage product is in general? Yeah, that's correct. I think there's still a lot of misconceptions out there. Really, you know, uh, these products are intended for, you know, for folks like, uh, uh, like your audience, like your listeners who are, um, keep paying close attention to their portfolios on a daily basis, looking advantage of tactical trades. Because as we know, um, depending upon the market environment you might in, the, they're not intended to be long-term holdings in, in the fact that 
we are seeking to get three times the exposure, for example, in FAS and FAZ on a daily basis. So every day, that's the goal. I mean, if you were to own that over a one-day, two-day, three-day period, it might actually deliver that perspective. It will on a daily basis, but not in an environment that might be highly volatile. Um, so trend is your friend with these particular products, but we really encourage everyone to understand how they're constructed and how they can be used. Um, in both the bull side and on the bear side. No, no doubt. Now, if we can talk about the small caps a bit, because the, between the TZA and the TNA, I know folks love to, love to trade that. What's so intriguing about the small caps in general, David, is that you know, the market's at highs, but yet the small caps cap uh, topped out in July of 2018. Yeah, they've been, they've been left far behind, uh, you know, the, uh, especially the, their, their large cap brothers and sisters. Um, and, it's, you know, uh, long-term uh, forecasters are pointing to that being a real negative on the markets um, where, you're, where you're not seeing risk on be confirmed because small caps are lagging so much. And there might be some truth to that. A lot of the reason, though, that small caps have underperformed over that time period actually comes down to something that's very simple. It comes down to the sector weight differences. Large cap dominated. Um, by our tech plus, and you know, yes. tech plus is really your your fang names um, that we're all in tech, and then of course with the Dick sector change um, made into a few other sectors. Financials, that's dominated in small cap. So when we talk about the issues that uh, FAS and uh, uh, FAZ have had from a long term perspective, um, it's not that dissimilar to small cap. Um, so a lot of financials in there uh, pulling down the the. Um, the overall price of, of that uh, of that area. Yes. But again, for people who are looking for more tactical opportunities, um, we've seen it in the small cap space too. Um, but yeah, it's been a difficult long term trade. It's pretty cool understanding. And I think what you, you folks have done is you get, to get people to understand different sectors, what's in the sector and what's in the weighting of the sector. The weighting of the sector is so tremendous, right? I mean, you have to understand that if you want to trade those vehicles. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of funny. You know, we often look just what's on the screen, right? Because uh, the price of an ETF, price of an uh, individual security, um, we can watch that, do put our indicators around that from a technical perspective. But at the end of the day, with these um, particular products, especially when you get to the sector and industry side, because some of the industry funds might only have 30 names in there, you still got to know what you own because at every day, the weights of that particular uh, securities in that are going to drive performance. So, you know, my point earlier, the regional banks um, are going to behave a lot uh, differently than just the large mega cap banks. Um, so for an investor who wants to weigh those two things together, we have the tools and opportunity set for them. You know, the same can be said uh, in a different area with our, you know, we have both a gold mining ETF, um, two of them, and then junior gold miners uh, on the leverage and inverse side. So in the long run, their performance is highly correlated, but because the juniors um, you know, are inherently riskier because of their, their mining operations, you tend to see a much, uh, much more volatile performance uh, out of those particular two products than even you do uh, with the larger cap space. And you know what's so cool about those two products, actually, is that there's so many listeners that actually, you know, are in the gold market and the juniors. And what I've seen is that they will basically hedge out, even if it's for a day, if they think a bad day is coming, which is pretty cool. Do you yeah, know what I'm no, saying? Yeah, they're a good tool for that. Yeah, it's huge. Listen, David, thank you so much for the great education. Really appreciate it and look forward to having you on again. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you. Stay right there, folks. We are coming right back. That was our man, Mr. David Mazza. He is the director, managing director, head of product development at Direction Trades.